Today we have Ayaz, uh, who is the co-founder of the Bus Ride Design Studio, uh, a leading architecture and interior design firm in India. So Ayaz is gra Ayaz graduated in industrial design, specializing in uh, product design uh, from NID Ahmedabad uh, in 2003. And uh, in 2006, he set up uh, the Bus Ride Design Studio with his uh, with his architect brother uh, Zamir as an independent design uh, studio dabbling in the design and creation of built environments. To start off with, like, could you uh, tell us a bit about your uh, route in design and obviously the life at NID? <laughs> so, I mean, uh, completely honestly, I sort of stumbled into design really. Uh, I uh, was um, on a really random trip to Ahmedabad with uh, with a friend from uh, Xavier's college. His grandmother lived in Ahmedabad and uh, his whole pitch was that let's go to Ahmedabad. She has a pool in her house. So okay. we were like, that sounds great. So we took a bus and landed up in Ahmedabad. And then uh, uh, his grandmother happened to be one of the Lal Bhais, right? So, uh, so she was, uh, you know, like an incredible house and, you know, peacocks walking all over the place. And I think she just wanted us to get yeah. out of the house. So she said, you know, you guys should really uh, go and see some of these other really nice places in Ahmedabad. So she pushed us to IIM and she pushed us to NID to see the campus. And uh, I went there and I remember standing in front of the product design showcase uh, at that time. And I didn't know that a single place in the world could have like, you know, everything that I was interested in, in one showcase. Uh, so that was incredible. Like, you know, right from model making to there were people doing illustrations and amazing renders. I, I always enjoyed drawing from the time I was a kid. So. Uh, I think I saw everything that I found cool in that one showcase, and I think at, at that point I kind of figured that okay, this is really a this is this is the place for me. I have to somehow get in here, um, and then it uh, it sort of flowed from there. So then I think the entrance exam happened, and uh, we just uh, ended up having a lot of fun in all the in, in the exams and in the interviews and all that. So I think uh, yeah, and then the I mean time at NID was a blast. We had a, I mean it was like great. <laughs> the most fun moments <laughs> on campus okay <laughs> great that's great so uh, like after that like what your what were your f first steps like uh, graduating to setting up your own studio and like kind of what inspired you and gave you the confidence to do so yeah uh, so i think just uh, straight out of college uh, i was fairly clear that i didn't want to uh, study more i think uh, those four years were enough, I think. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to kind of, you know, uh, work, uh, start working. Uh, I uh, I started working with this startup design office in Dubai called Idea Spice, and uh, this was again one of my uh, very close friends and seniors, Sajit Ansar, who uh, set up Idea Spice. So I was working with him in Dubai uh, for three years, and um, that was actually a fully deep dive into everything, you know, right from uh, making quotations to invoices to uh, the, the okay. whole sort of paraphernalia. Uh, and I think that three years was like a, you know, really like a boot camp in terms of uh, running a business, uh, all the kind of stresses and strains that it goes through. Uh, and post that, I think, uh, I remember in uh, after working in Dubai for around three, three and a half years, I kind of figured that uh, I there was one person I really wanted to work with, which was my father. Uh, because he's a very, very old school architect, uh, you know, with like 40 years of experience in joinery and how to make things. Because we used to end up sitting in an air-conditioned office and making drawings and they were being, you know, fabricated uh, completely without any kind of, uh, you know, involvement. I moving back to uh, Bombay and setting up a studio uh, with my brother and working with dad. Uh, it was like a really interesting uh, mix because uh, uh, we were able to then, you know, uh, get much, much more involved in the, every single aspect of uh, bringing things uh, into kind of uh, existence. We always wanted to be very flexible. We didn't start off with any kind of big manifesto or uh, we just wanted to have a lot of fun mm. uh, and uh, kind of, you know, uh, and set up a very loose umbrella under which all of us could do whatever we wanted to do. Cool. That's interesting. Yeah. So uh, I'd just uh, like to come to the name bus ride. So like, why the name Bus Ride and like, is there a story behind it and can you like share a, the story if it's there? Yeah, there's like an unholy story mostly. It's, uh, it, was, uh, my, it was my name in, uh, in ragging. So that's the truth. Uh, I mean, it was actually this uh, Pratap Bose who's, uh, you know, currently a really respectable, uh, you know, he leads design at Mahindra. He's a, you know, fairly respectable character, but at that point he was not respectable. 
so he used to call me he used to call me bus ride just like you know hey bus ride come here hey bus ride do this kind of thing so, uh, okay sort of uh, yeah just became one of those things that you want to you want to own it <laughs> <laughs> that's a great way to like to own it yeah <laughs> so uh, so like, next is something throughout you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, so the, the next thing is like uh, can you tell us a bit about what bus ride is uh, currently doing and also something about uh, the bus ride lab which is i think located at goa right now yeah um so yeah so we are pretty much a built environment studio we work with uh, most environments that uh, you know right from set design to exhibitions to you know uh, institutional environments uh, hotels restaurants stuff like that i mean anything that requires to be built um and uh, we're also dabbled a bit in sort of building virtually so you know uh, so yeah i mean environments which are uh, say consumed on television or film uh the bus ride lab actually uh, so Uh, when we were kind of you know maybe uh, eight or nine years into running the studio in Mumbai, we kind of realized that there were a lot of very small experiments, but they were kind of slipping through the gaps. You know, we weren't able to kind of give them mm-hmm. enough time and love. And uh, one of these was something called the Gypsy Kitchen, which is sort of a zero-profit restaurant that we used to run with a very close friend, Gresham Fernandez. Uh, there was a couple of uh, you know documentation projects, which actually, uh, in fact, Vivek Shet, uh, he was uh, doing his diploma with us, and he. Uh, started off this amazing thing okay. called the Ranbir project with us. So there were a couple of these mm-hmm. really uh, very very deeply passionate projects which we felt very strongly about, but we were not able to kind of you know uh, build a practice around it because they used to just slip through the cracks in terms of uh, you know uh, the day to day running of the office. So uh, then me and Zamir kind of decided that we should set up another studio which would keep those projects at their heart. You know, uh, so that's where the lab started off. So uh, through the lab, we've been trying to do a lot of uh, you know workshops um, you know inviting uh, practitioners to goa to kind of uh, share with us inside uh, to do lab to do three or four day labs and workshops to kind of you know create an open source uh, resource um, which could potentially be used by anyone uh, anyone practicing in the field mm-hmm. uh, so it's mostly a research documentation uh, some amount of projects that come out of those kind of things as well and um, but yeah i mean it's 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 a constant struggle to keep a research practice that is uh, you know self funded so it's still being kind of yeah. uh, offset by the design practice great <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, i mean one of the ideas is that you bring a little bit of that polyvalence uh, that we used to uh, try to do in our design practice we try to bring some of that fun and polyvalence and you know maybe tangential thinking to some level in research as well so it's a fairly uh, effervescent kind of uh, thing we don't have a single inquiry that we're really focusing on it's you know trying to shoot in the dark in many places <laughs> yeah good so uh the next is like uh, about your experience which you can share which uh, with us like which would have had ended your business maybe so a bad experience according to you <laughs> wow Uh, ended up business ah huh? oh man so uh, i i think you know, there is something to do with scale for sure like i think if i have to think back mm-hmm. um uh there's a, there's a certain time in your uh, in your practice when uh, there's a certain scale of project that kind of appears right uh, it could be yeah. uh, and this still could be wrong for you uh, right so you could be say two or three projects uh, down and you get like an urban planning project or you get a hotel project or you get something really uh, to design a hospital for example which uh, you know which mm-hmm. requires a certain level of um, uh, i wouldn't say maturity of thinking because i think a lot of people do have that maturity right off the bat but there's a certain conception of how to work with teams or a certain conception of what what uh, you know the, this kind of complexity of going about things like this which cannot be uh, undermined you know so uh, i think we got a project to design this five star hotel in cochin uh, and uh, i think uh, we started off on the project but i think halfway through we realized that we are really really underqualified to do this uh, project you know so we had this uh, very frank conversation with the ownership saying that okay i know that you trusted us but i really feel we are not the right fit for this project and we were able to walk away from that i feel uh, uh to you know to uh, I, i i i do feel many times that that project would have really uh, gone horribly off if uh, <laughs> if we had continued you know just trying to chase the money or whatever i think it would have uh, it, it was a good call i think in retrospect um so another really random one actually when the we had uh, uh, in idea spice actually we were uh, we were commissioned to build the world's largest shopping cart 
you know, we didn't think too much about it. Just kind of built it out and you know got into the Guinness Book of Records and all of that. Uh, but you mm-hmm. know, there are many, many, many sleepless nights. I think about and man, what if that thing had fallen down or you know killed five, six people? Uh, <laughs> you know, there was no, there was no structural engineer on the project. It was just like you know trying out stuff on Rhino and seeing how ah, yeah, approximately thick lag raha hai. So I mean, there was that little. Uh, Uh, random side of it as well, which uh, <laughs> could have gone horribly wrong. I think. Okay, <laughs> great. So uh, yeah, the the next question goes to like generally designers uh, want to leave a mark, but on the other hand, your individual style is uh, seems to be psychedelic, but it's not apparent in the works you have uh, done with the clients. So <laughs> like, how do you go with it and? Can you elaborate on it? Where have you seen all this psychedelic work? What is this psychedelic work? So, like, so, so, uh, what we went through, I was going through that issue thing. So, most of the, even the, the publications on the issue, so they have a kind <laughs> of uh, that taste. <laughs> That's because on issue you can make uh, very low res images, uh, you know, fill up the whole page by just arranging them. So it's like a way of working mm-hmm. with those images, really. It it maybe it comes down to where you put value on your own uh, contribution as a design practice, right? Uh, like so, if uh, if there is a certain value yeah. which is ascribed to um, say being uh, say creating a fantastic new aesthetic, right? Uh, and if if that is where one puts value, uh, then uh, then you're obviously preoccupied with making a mark, and you know people recognize your work over time, and you know that's why sort of people get stuck in treatments that okay i'm this kind of person or that kind of person i will only use monochrome i will only use this kind of thing mm. um uh, and that over time essentially becomes a blinker right you're only able to see things that way uh but uh i think for us like we've always uh, thrived on this uh, this particular stage in a project which is redefinition right like uh, we've kind of also realized this that you know when ideas are rejected uh there's this very mm-hmm. there's this very weird satisfaction ke uh acha bhi ek aur sochna padega you know it's like that uh, and it's a it's a thing that we yeah. spotted very late in work like it used to be like you know first idea rejected second idea even more even more weird uh third idea so even more weird like you know so you always trying to uh, see how much you can push you know like how much you can uh how far out there can you really push briefs and i think uh, because we uh, value that redefinition phase um uh, you know once you've done your initial ideation and brainstorming and all of that uh, when you've checked all the boxes uh, you know especially i'm talking about hospitality environments because a lot of our work was mm-hmm. in restaurants and bars and stuff like that. you know when you when you've cracked all the layouts and you know uh, the clients are fairly happy that okay these guys understand how things are going to work at that point you can really twist the whole project on its head right because uh, yeah. they've also you know maybe paid you two payments already so they're already committed to working with you and at that point you know when they doubt your sanity that's really really fun they like okay man is this really what they want to do you know um like just for the purely for example smokers delhi worked out that way you know we had a very different aesthetic in mind in the beginning but mm-hmm. halfway through the project we realized that could be really interesting to hand draw the whole restaurant right so then uh, that that we kind of made a reverse pitch to uh, to riaz who's someone who you know usually trusts us with what <laughs> what he comes with uh and he was uh, saying yeah man go for it you know so uh, it, the project suddenly changed and became something else but um uh but at that point you know then you know you're not really married up married to saying okay now every project is going to be hand drawn every project has to be uh, has to follow that kind of with or whatever you know? so yeah the the this next question is kind of uh, about the specific project so like can you share your experience uh, working on the design of uh, the iconic uh, the cafe at the iconic prithvi theater mumbai and like a bit about designing of the the prithvi chair so yeah oh wow yeah oh that was really fun yeah that was really lovely uh, this project was also an exercise in invisibility you know uh, so the um, because the, the prithvi cafe is something which is like an already an institution like you know no no one wants to redesign it uh yeah. it's like say someone coming and redesigning the bmw behind uh, nid and you know uh <laughs> making it yeah. slanty and all that you know the i mean everyone would be up in arms you know they be like no we like it the way it is you know like uh, leave it let it be there mm. uh True. so i think it's the same kind of um, the same kind of thing that we had at the prithvi theater which was uh, something to very deeply respect right i mean uh, you you don't want to shake things up and make it look like some new young design studio has come and done some hanky panky in the middle um so the idea was to kind of do almost an invisible fit out right uh, so you're just taking mm-hmm. away the functional issues you're adding fans and adding functionality which um, 
also these kind of uh, adding frameworks which they could use for festivals they could use for you know uh, so you're always designing it to be incomplete uh, it is going to be completed by mm-hmm. the theater community right so i yeah. think in the uh, what we noticed about uh, uh, this is actually something that came out of just hanging out there a lot that we kind of realized that a lot of theater folk uh, they used to take their shoes off and uh, and sit with their feet up right uh, so mm-hmm. and because they this is for a long time this when they're doing readings like you're you know doing a script reading as the four and a half hour five hour meeting so uh, so we wanted to create something which is fairly institutional looking and it's inspired by the theater itself so the form was kind of easy but the ergonomics of that chair are really weird you know it's almost 26 inch deep uh, which is actually okay. doesn't work for most chairs uh, you know but uh, in this case it works because people were, were able to actually take off their shoes and sit with their feet up uh, on the chair mm-hmm. and uh, you can actually sit on that chair in many different postures so it's uh, you know by dangling your legs over the side of it and these are all postures that we've observed in the theater and to see how people interact with uh, you know uh, uh, with chairs so i think Uh, it was it was fully customized for that particular project and uh, then it got it got it got popular some friends uh, kind of asked us to make more uh, so then we also retail <laughs> next uh, is like about your family so how important for you is your, your is your family and like has it hindered or like helped you in 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 what way like uh, what's what's your take on it um so yeah so i mean th- i think family is uh, it, it didn't start that way i mean none of us uh, me my brother or my father none of us thought that we'd work together because uh, we were doing fairly different mm-hmm. things uh but i think um, uh, and it's also something that we don't take lightly it's you know it's uh, it, we're already a very close knit family very very kind of um, you know uh, so i mean when you start working with someone who you're already very close to there you you think 100 times about how things can go wrong right uh so we me and my brother actually started freelancing together first because we were very wary about getting into something which you know like uh, you it's, it's any way a fragile situation so you don't want to like mess things up uh but uh, but it worked fantastically i mean you know whenever we've uh, worked together uh, i mean he's on a very very different page from where i am uh we're both different people but at the same time i think uh, projects benefit when two people look at them from completely different lenses so I think that's really helped us. I mean, uh, it's the the practice is completely molded by you know two people looking at uh, everything, um, and I would say like uh, in an extended net extended sense, I think people who work in the studio uh, also bring in a lot of energy. Like you know, I mean, uh, especially when you see that someone's passionate about one particular thing, uh, you know, the one of the ideas of keeping a very loosely defined studio is that you can actually give a lot of agency to people who want to do their own research projects, who want to do their own. uh kind of inquiries so um so yeah that's something which hopefully we kind of uh, try to be as open as possible to the studio going into exciting new ways through kind of collaborations and through kind of different perspectives okay so uh the next uh, question is like to a newbie can you can you tell something like can you tell what is uh, speculative design and uh <laughs> yeah so in a in a short like maybe in simple manner something um yeah so i think you know the, the best way to look at uh, it as a uh, is if if it's uh, say uh, say set against the regular design process right uh, when uh, when you have mm-hmm. a design pro- when you have a design project uh, you start off with a brief uh, and then you go through the different stages of that like the brief if you're in a classroom project would come from faculty if you're in a professional environment would come from clients uh, and then you kind yeah. of follow the sort of regular design process that takes you to the end now uh, there are certain Uh, shortcomings with that pro- the process right uh, essentially what happens is because you've set so many parameters for yourself uh, the projects tend to be in a very safe zone uh, they kind of you know exist in, exist uh, in a particular zone which is mediated by many things like client budget uh, timelines uh, you know uh, just you may just not be creative at that point and you may not have the bandwidth to ext- uh, sort of you know engage with something uh, at the extremes for example but uh, speculative fiction i feel it predates the design process you know speculative fiction is world building so it allows you to actually create mm-hmm. a, it it allows you to create the pre conditions for a design brief to emerge so uh, and it also uh, pushes people to engage with the extremes like you know how horribly wrong can this go or if this is wi- wildly successful how uh, you know how will it completely uh, you know impact uh, say the environment your design yeah. for example so i feel uh, speculative fiction is something which is almost like an ongoing process that you need to keep going uh 
I think uh, it, it also runs. It, it also runs a few risks, uh, especially right now, because speculative fiction is now becoming this new buzzword. Uh, it, mm, it runs yeah. the risk of getting. Uh, it runs the risk of getting co-opted by uh, the market, uh, right? Like so, a lot of brands will essentially have speculative fiction workshops to say how, uh, like, what is the future of Adidas? So, what is the future of Nike, for example? Now, uh, that is very scary because you're using a very powerful tool of world building, but applying it to commerce. right uh, so i think speculative fiction is very yeah. closely tied into critical design which actually has to critique uh, where society is moving uh, it cannot be devoid of politics right uh, you cannot take speculative fiction out of politics and say okay let's uh, completely use it as a design creative tool it works there but it loses its edge you know it loses its feel. yeah this next question comes from a batchmate of mine which is from mumbai so like for you is it uh, bombay or mumbai and uh, to which to which do you relate the most and uh, how has it influenced uh, you and your work wow that's really interesting um uh, you know so i feel uh, this is a it's a little bit to do with our studio maturity like you know as we we kind of you know uh, had very different lo- ways of looking at this like uh, i think in the first say 5 to 6 years uh, we were very very bombay centric like it was always about bombay that you know that uh, you're always missing for a kind of city that used to exist and uh, you know because there were certain politics at, uh, associated with the shift of the word uh, bombay to mumbai Uh, it was set in opposition to a certain kind of westernized culture for example or a certain kind of uh, you know more inclusive uh, culture so there were certain connotations when mm-hmm. you uh, when you say mumbai uh, i think what's what's happened in a in a beautiful way is uh, that the city has also dissolved its identity to a large extent uh, you know we've started working very actively with the municipality uh, so we do a lot of work with the h ward in bandra for example uh trying to do pedestrianization mm-hmm. projects uh, you know street upgrade projects uh so i think we've become as a practice much closer to the idea of mumbai uh than uh, what we started off with right so uh i think uh, in in there there's some sort of a, a sense of maturity that you know as a practice as as well we've kind of uh, you know moved into a much more flexible much more open idea of uh, our own involvement with the city so uh, So yeah. I think we've we've kind of moved, uh, thankfully, from Bombay to Mumbai. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, okay. So uh, the next is next question is as uh, students, NID is very close to your hearts always. So we all have certain experiences that have shaped us. So do you have any such ex- experience that was uh, valuable for you as a student? Uh, yeah, lots, man. I mean, I think. Uh, Uh, I think we were, we were there on campus around the time of the earthquake. Uh, so okay. there was, uh, of course, I think this two thousand one earthquake. So, um, uh, so I think what was really amazing to see is a lot of my batchmates, uh, for example, were able to, uh, like I wasn't. I was in complete shock, and you know, like I couldn't walk into a building thinking that ये तो अभी गिरने वाला है. You know, it's like uh, it shakes your, uh, it shakes your, uh, you know, when you see the whole library dome moving. <laughs> uh okay it really, it really shakes your faith in structure so uh, i think i really needed to you know go back into uh, go back home and you know spend some time but i think a lot of my batchmates for example honor one uh, who's a, a filmmaker very close friend i mean he was able to get beyond his uh, personal trauma and uh, directly jump into contributing right so he went to bhuj he uh, was able to kind of engage with uh, setting up a small school for children in uh, in the earthquake uh, in in bhuj for example uh i mean these kind of stories uh, you know you realize really that um, that uh, that i mean uh, you know as design education you can't be a bystander right i mean you have to be yeah. someone who's very very invested sure. in us. i mean i think those those sort of formative experiences they've at least um, they i mean i think they're, they're pushing us towards more public facing work right now for example you know that uh, you don't want to be content with doing private commissions you also want to be sort of you know visible on the street uh, want to be able to contribute to street culture uh you know do more public facing work uh, primarily so i think mm-hmm. uh, those experiences are really interesting also collaborations i think uh, being part of a campus like an id or you already kind of learn the tools for collaboration uh, you know how to kind of talk to people who are not you or out of your comfort zone yeah. <laughs> that's fantastic True. okay so i think like uh, we'll uh, shift to the questions from audience i can see six uh, questions so maybe we'll take them So it's from Alimur. 
uh, underscore YCR. Okay, so uh, what are you reading currently? And suggestion of movie, music, books. I'm currently reading. Uh, so I mean, I try to read a couple of books at the same time, like uh, because I tend to get bored fast. So then you kind of, you know, uh, start one, stop somewhere, read something else. So I just finished uh, this book called Entangled Life. uh by martin shelby okay. um i forget the name but i'm reading something about the gut right now about like uh, i think it's called i forget the name <laughs> okay and uh, there's always a one or two graphic novels which is being reread so i'm kind of reading uh, this graphic novel series called lucifer right now um mm-hmm. yeah otherwise i can okay. share some recommendations on the bate page maybe <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. That will be great. Uh, I'm sure you guys are seeing lots more fun stuff, man. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, okay. There's one more question from uh, the same user who is: uh, Your work is quite political. Just want to know your views regarding the same. So that's the question. <laughs> I don't think so, actually. I mean, I think uh, we're mm-hmm. still in a very, very moderate kind of mid zone. Uh, i think uh, fairly aware that uh, you know you're a, mi- you're a minority community um yeah i mean i think we're, we're trying to sort of uh, you know have a voice uh, but i don't think we're we we if we were anywhere uh, i think infl- i mean I, i have like a fairly self critical perspective on this i feel if we were anywhere uh, influencing anything we would uh, not be doing what we're doing <laughs> yeah we must uh, underground somewhere <laughs> so uh next question is uh from uh balraj karbanda what was the thought process in designing the bandra project uh slash the fashion project uh, typhoon shelter in mumbai for pizza expresses express uh, was it client brief or your own creativity yeah so i think there was no client brief as such in that particular project i mean uh, it was a very challenging property because there were no windows uh, no views you know the you know in the armpit of the mall basically so this <laughs> is a really horrible site uh and uh, in there i mean uh, i think so, so most of the most of the cues for hospitality projects do come from the food you know in terms of uh, we try to understand what the kitchen is thinking uh in most cases right so in typhoon shelter it was a very particular kind of food which was uh, this kind of uh, food that was uh, created in the typhoon shelters of hong kong so that's where the cuisine gets its name from and uh, this was a place where fishermen from different communities used to come and uh, rest uh, or you know kind of shelter when there was a typhoon outside uh, so because they were all together in that particular space they used to share recipes and share uh, ways of cooking and uh, so through that sharing there was a certain kind of cuisine that emerged uh, you know which is uh, what that particular restaurant was referencing um so so kind of you know just kind of read a lot about that story and understand you know that they say the aftermath of a typhoon what would it be like so we used a lot of rubbish in the fit out uh so i mean this sort of uh, i guess just plant clues into uh you know peaking people's interest about finding out more about the food or finding out more about the culture and i think uh, those kind of stories in most cases resonate with uh, hospitality environments because uh, people are really kind of looking to see uh the flavor of what you're there for uh it doesn't need to be spelled out normally like if you read the same thing in a menu saying acha ye rabel iske liye uh it mm-hmm. i think it, it takes away some of the magic of it i think it uh, so i think if it's done tangentially and done tongue in cheek and done in a fun way i think uh, it resonates a bit more and the next question is from alia per uh, yeah so i i can't tell the name so like what made you think of opening up a design lab at goa uh i mean how did this shift come in your mind and if someone wants to shift city what would be your suggestion uh i mean these shifts have happened uh, fairly organically uh, you know because uh, at the point when we were shifting from bombay i had a one year old son uh so i think mm-hmm. uh, uh, just the access to more space and you know having the flexibility to run around and uh, have an outdoor life as well i mean those were kind of some of the criteria that were also happening parallelly uh at the same time uh, we were also looking at setting up a slightly different kind of studio so we uh, like i didn't want to i didn't want to start a goa arm of bus ride uh, it was supposed to be yeah. a, a collaborative space called the greenhouse so th- this was along with quicksand 
uh, which is also a, a design research outfit uh, based in Delhi and Bangalore, uh, with a very close friend Abhinash. Uh, so he was also shifting around the same time. Uh, there's another. Uh, so Abhinash's wife Urvashi runs a company called Tandem Research, which is also a design, uh, is a research and strategy firm. So uh, we were we we got talking around the same time uh, of migrating a part of our practice to Goa. Right. So all of us uh, were doing. Uh, you know, almost like day jobs in different cities, but uh, taking a part of that practice and shifting into another location, uh, where we could explore a very flat hierarchy. You know, where uh, that studio was not set up with, uh, you know, like many many people working under someone. It was set up in a more uh, flatter hierarchy. So I think uh, for all of us, it became a experiment in seeing how we could run a practice differently. Um, so we were one part of the greenhouse, for example, in Goa for four years. And um, yeah, I mean, it, so that that helped, like that you're trying to set up a different kind of practice really in in another city, uh, running at a slightly slower speed also. Okay, uh, I'll I'll take the next question from uh, Neverland underscore. Okay, so what are your opinions on virtual spaces, surveillance, and commodification? Yeah, those are the new battlegrounds. Yeah, I mean, those are the places where uh, I think a lot of uh, you know the next generation of politics is going to be played out in these uh, in virtual spaces so i think uh, so for sure like it's very very important to kind of engage very deeply with the uh, with the creation of these virtual spaces uh, there's this one thing that you know one, maybe one could learn from uh, the shortcomings of real life spaces that you know when there is a certain composition of a team that is uh, you know very homogenous like you have say like five guys sitting in a room uh, thinking about what uh, Uh, you know uh, what a space should be like and what is cool and what is fun uh mm-hmm. those kind of spaces tend to have a certain grammar which is defined a lot of the gaming industry or a lot of virtual space creation industry for a long time but i think once those once those teams get a bit more heterogeneous like once you have uh, you know people across different demographics across different religions castes genders uh once the teams that conceive of these spaces become a bit more uh, open and inclusive i think uh, the design of the spaces will uh, will definitely become a lot more uh, inclusive so i think uh, there's some clues to be drawn from the way things are conceived of um and i think uh, what's really lovely is about the way uh, you know maybe the current tech environment is able to actually foster these kind of teams um like people actually can lend their voices to different projects at different times the next question is uh from piece of uh, he he's he's asking do all designers move to aerodynamic hairstyle is it stress or time to be like go uh, bald if i'm a designer <laughs> yeah aerodynamic is good to put it for sure <laughs> <laughs> okay so uh, next question is from viksha m so she's asking uh, does your industrial design education inform your spatial decisions yeah very very interesting so i i think uh, that's one of the biggest uh, you know differentiators between the way uh, say i look at things and the way say my brother amir looks at things because uh, so he's an architect uh, he studied at cept and i so I, i think this the sort of macro micro perspective definitely helps uh i feel uh, especially in industrial design we were uh, allowed to work very flu- very freely with material uh which in many uh, architectural practices it actually comes as a bit of an afterthought you know uh you kind of sort of more focused on the graphic quality of layouting and you know how it looks in shadow and i think the the sort of uh, mm. more tactile feel of you know how things can be sculpted uh like you know everything everything can be shaped like when you ask an architecture what is the proportion of uh, when you ask an architect what is the proportion of a brick uh you will straight away get a simple answer like a 5 by 3 by 2 or whatever but like uh for an industrial designer the brick has no real uh you know uh no real uh dimension uh i mean it it can be whatever it can be casted it can be molded it can be shaped it can be you know uh, so i mean i think uh, just mm-hmm. allowing uh those two perspectives to be uh, respected in the same organization uh i think that's helped us also to kind of uh, be a lot more playful with projects uh so the next question is from uh, hikari uh, underscore kami underscore so how are uh, design research and strategy projects handled at the bus right uh how do you take up new projects 
Um, so I think uh, we're also, I think, in a very nascent stage of uh, design research in that sense. Uh, we had a couple of, uh, you know, commission projects which were around uh, uh, heritage conservation. So this was something which was commissioned by Asian Paints. Uh, but I think that was a that was a very uh, particular kind of uh, project, you know. So uh, and I think definitely in research it works a bit differently, where you um, have to create a very well working proposal. So you have to do a lot of work before the uh, before the project actually comes into the studio. Uh, you have to create almost a like a project list, a chart of like, okay, this is the funding that you need, this is the time duration you need, this is the team that you need, and then approach people who you believe would be, uh, you know. Uh, interested to sponsor something of the on on those lines, uh, which is not normally the way a design office works. You know, a design office uh, like and especially for a small practice like ours, we're not a big office. We're like you know, uh, ten, twelve people max. Uh, so when uh, projects come in, it's all it's mostly word of mouth. You know, like that you have a certain you know you're yeah. done work, come on, and that person refers, and then that person refers. So uh, many times you're not controlling uh, the kind of work that you're getting. You know, it's uh, say you do something which which is a kind of project and then you will get three other projects which are very similar to that first project because you know that's what uh, i mean this happened to us a lot from, with social for example like you know because after doing the first social in bangalore uh, which uh, became a bit of a hit at that point uh, you know every alternate person would be like hey, i thought you guys did social so we like something like that but slightly different you know uh, to a point yeah. where you start uh, to a point where you realize that uh, you know <laughs> That whole pipeline of work itself is a bit flawed. Uh, so, but I think the research projects have that certain opportunity that you can create something completely uh, fresh uh, and find a sponsor or a person who uh, would back that project. You know, uh, but I think it's uh, it's something we're still figuring out. I mean, I don't think uh, we've cracked any kind of uh, formula for this. Uh, companies like Quicksand, for example, have uh, done a lot more research work than us. So they have a much more robust network. Uh, they have, you know, people writing into them for research projects, which uh, I think in uh, in our in, in my experience, it's not uh, not happened yet for us. So we're still having to go out and do pitches and do all the hard work. So uh, the next question is uh, so uh, it's by uh, Nambia Rabjit. Ravijit, so uh, what are you? What are your thoughts on newbie designers starting up with their own office, and what's your take on it? I mean, it's 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 great. I think there's no. Uh, I mean, I would. Uh, it's very exciting to see you know uh, very fresh perspectives on this. Uh, I mean, I don't think there's a single way one can go about. I think uh, I think you know when you're ready. Like, you know when you're ready, you're ready. Uh, it could actually come after doing a masters. It could come after doing, uh, you know, working in a short place. Uh, I would say if, if you're exposed to as many diverse uh, points of view, uh, uh, I don't know. That's also that's also very chutia advice. I think uh, what what really uh, what what really is the best way to do it is that uh, you know when you're ready to to take the plunge, uh, you do it. But keep your practice. Uh, always looking for collaborations, right? Like uh, you could have that uh, very promiscuous, very kind of uh, learning and atmosphere, uh, even while working. Uh, and I think uh, what's what's really interesting uh, where design practice is moving is that it's almost moving into jazz music kind of a territory, where you will have a certain uh, voice, or you have, a, or you say play a certain instrument really well. Uh, you can lend your voice to multiple projects. You know, uh, you don't necessarily need to. Say okay, uh, I am the be all and end all, and now this is my vision, and people will come to me for this. Uh, you know, this very star like. It's it's. I think it's the old uh, way of operating, uh, especially in architectural practices. There's this whole notion of star architects. You know where, मतलब मैं साइन करूँगा और मेरे लिए लोग आएंगे. Uh, I think that that whole conception is going out of the window, really. So I think, it, and it, it's for it's for you guys to you know uh, to chart this out, like you know that how do you share credits, how do you share, uh, how do you share money, how do you share you know know how knowledge. Uh, it, it is moving into a very very strong uh, copy left uh, open economy kind of a structure, um, and we are in this sort of cusp generation, you know, running like practices for ten twelve years. Uh, we are also trying to you know keep up with the way things are going but uh, but i think people who are setting up their practice today have a fundamentally different uh, environment to uh, populate uh, 
it it got to be a lot about collaboration got to be a lot about trying out many many new things uh, it's so tough to bracket people's work also now like ye acha ye to product design hai to product design karega you know all that is completely gone now yeah so uh, the next question is uh, like from the same person uh, he is asking uh, when you try documenting runbur in bandra can you elaborate on those projects yeah i mean fantastic so i think uh, you know when uh, so in fact this was completely driven by vivek uh, shet uh, i think you guys probably know vivek he's around campus mm. a lot <laughs> so uh, yeah. so vivek was uh, I, i mean i got talking to vivek in nid and then uh, he was talking about his interest in heritage and uh this also came uh, on the back of you know uh, me and zamir talking about the fact that you know we live in this place but we don't really understand how it works you know uh and a very interesting uh you know it is actually started off from a failure like we were trying to build a small garden uh, outside our studio so this is a dump yard you know there were there were this, there were rats the size of dogs running around over there outside every day and uh, you know we got we got a dumpster on one sunday to clean up that whole garden patch and we thought like you know we had some extra bogan villa line from one moka project long back so we were like yaar ye bogan villa to udhar hi jayega so they were anyway going to throw those plants we said we'll just go and plant it there uh, so we went there on one sunday cleared out the whole place started putting plants in and uh, someone called the cops right so we got uh, taken to the thana to the police station for questioning they okay, who are you where have you come from why are you you know uh, capturing this land and all so we were like nahi nahi hum log ko kuch we took out a laptop and showed them presentation ki hum log ko to park banana hai right? so they were like you know you can't just randomly go and make a park you have to take people's permission mm-hmm. and all that and it's a gout run it's basically follows different rules from uh, the other one so so then we went to all the homes and explained the design to them and you know we're doing a small smoking area we're going to clean it up you can sit there in the evening read a book have a beer whatever and uh, next time we again started work on next sunday this time the cops came in 5 minutes so they had already preempted that these guys are going to come back and uh, so you know in that we are, we realize that we do not understand how the city works you know that there is a uh, little or no understanding of how things work in the real world so vivek's entire project was to decode uh, you know document decode bandra and see what makes it tick you know what what uh, what gives bandra mm. side of it what are the different stakeholders around um and we tried to keep most of his research open source it was shared with everyone who he interviewed uh in fact some of the maps that he drew for anwar other ones are still being used for surveys uh so okay it's kind of become really interesting projects and for us it started off a long uh list of uh, interventions and ideas with bandra uh, which is now slowly grown into something called the bandra collective so there is actually six different architectural studios uh, all working together to do pro bono work for bandra right so uh mm-hmm. so think these things are and these are ongoing projects like i mean it, it's never going to say okay ho gaya kaam you know it's it's uh, hopefully uh you know one of us will leave and the leave the collective and more people join the collective so it, it's going to be an ongoing uh, inquiry in fact in goa we're trying to work with uh, something called the goa collective which is uh, three uh, three studios again pulling in resources to do more public facing work in goa so um, so these things are now becoming part of uh, uh things that we really really enjoy doing So uh the next question is uh from Shekhar Badwe so who inspires oh. you the most is the question <laughs> Who inspires me the most I think it's Shekhar Shekhar is the source of all my inspiration <laughs> <laughs> and first of all there's a question from uh, Ratna Sutaria so uh, the question is if you are uh, if you are to be an academician uh, acad- uh, academician so in a design school how and what kind of narrative would you build whoa i would uh, i mean uh, so i mean i've been coming to nid to teach uh, the finally exhibition uh, i think till till around 2 years ago uh, okay i uh, i really enjoy that uh, interaction uh, it's with exhibition design uh, final year um so i think yeah something to do with space for sure and i think uh, speculative speculative futures was a lot of fun to do because i feel um, uh especially at that stage you know in fourth year uh, where you can actually take a lot of what you've learned in the last 3 4 years uh try to pull all of it together into a kind of a very powerful storytelling tool um i think that that was a lot of fun to explore with students so uh i don't think i had much to teach there but i, I kind of just uh, i think there was more to learn uh so i think just to come and 
uh, hang out with people who don't have the baggage of you know uh, too much experience and all that, and we're still like sort of yeah. trying to. Uh, I think that that was really kind of. Uh, I mean, for me, it was very very uh, refreshing and very uh, very very inspiring to be on campus uh, for those times. Um, so yeah, I think uh, maybe just all kinds of stuff. I mean, yeah. learning from music, learning from art. Uh, kind of going a bit wide outside the um, mm-hmm. creating space, for example. How do you manage a, a design practice with its diversity and uh, subjectivity? Any any framework uh, to begin with? So I mean, uh, there are a few things that we do prioritize. I would say. Uh, I mean, I think uh, aesthetic is not one of them. Like, I don't think we uh, we look at projects uh, too. I mean, too closely about how they look. uh i think uh, uh for us i think storytelling has always been important like uh trying to uh, uh really really tell the story in a evocative slightly tangential way of what that place is about uh so i think uh, i mean it also brings me back to a thing we were talking about earlier around redefinition right like that you, when you have uh the first idea being rejected second idea being rejected third idea being rejected uh you actually Uh, tend to become more and more tangential, like you're you're looking further and further out for, uh, for the for the 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 core story of that particular project, and uh, I think this rejection usually happens in house. You know, uh, we try to reject our own ideas first so that it pushes us to think, uh, one step, two step, three step further, uh, and I think uh, that's something that that we've really enjoyed doing. Uh, that it's not been so much about the efficiency of building something really fast or you know. Getting back the next day with some sort of uh, suggestions or ideas. I mean, you kind of try to surprise yourself first, so that you can surprise someone else, uh, yeah, as well. And uh, true, I think just sort of deep research as well helps because uh, I give you I give you one example, right? So we were building this Mokhas Valley on uh, Lavelle Road in Bangalore. uh and those of you are familiar with bangalore uh, you know it, it's it's uh, for example this the garden city i mean there's some really really lovely stories uh, that you know bangalore is kind of uh, famous for but uh, we took a unique constraint on lavelle road uh, we said let's only research uh, the history of that one strip of that one road thing so we were able to kind of you know deep dive into one street and find some incredible stories there uh, so in fact like india's first ufo sighting was on lavelle road uh and uh, okay there was uh, <laughs> yeah uh there was this guy michael lavelle who was a gold prospector who set up the coal ore mines uh, he lived on that street uh you know so uh, there's some uh, i think the, the, the deeper you go in terms of storytelling uh you you always find gold you, know, you always find some amazing stuff uh so i think mm-hmm. that's a bit of uh, you know i think given up that anxiety of you know coming up with ideas i think there are lots of things to explore uh it's just a matter of selecting the right tangent that you want to explore you know but the last question is from uh, siddhartha s uh, will the brilliant dirty old man series start again uh, that's the question <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah for sure i mean i've been i've been uh, so i mean i started this dirty old man thing a while ago as a you know i mean i used to take uh, a4 printouts uh, of the sticker on sticker sheet and uh, okay. there were only kind of you know really creepy nude self portraits uh, okay and, uh, i used to I, i mean they were started off to put into in flight magazines so i used to travel like with mm-hmm. a stack of you know 50 60 uh, dirty old mans and stick them in all the in flight magazines that i could find uh <laughs> okay and that and that that's all like, i've been i've been doing this for a while like this kind of uh, self portraits of myself when i'm 80 years old or whatever and i already look like that i mean like, uh, <laughs> charlie's my own great <laughs> great good thank you ayaz it was a really amazing and fun session and thank you for accepting our invite and being a part of bathi session so thank you my pleasure shubham all the best to you guys man stay safe yes 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 so thank you thank you everyone for joining in and like see you see you guys at the next session again so thank you ayaz once again bye thanks a lot bye take care bye